Hey, good morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and sing this first song together. It's called Lion and the Lamb. For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb, and every knee will bow before Make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battle. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee will bow before Him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 No one. Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fire. Oh, the lion and 
Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest Baptist Church family. Thanks so much for joining us online again. Um, I'm glad you're able to do this. We are really excited though, because right now at the exact same time that this is being shown, for the very first time, we are also doing a service at the exact same time right out there on the front lawn. And so I'm really excited about that and uh, really hoping that with the time change and moving a little bit later, you've got an extra hour of sleep um, that hopefully we'll, we'll be having some more people out there on the front lawn today. But anyway, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. And as you're turning there, let's just go ahead and open the service up uh, with a word of prayer. 
Father in heaven, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to come and gather around your word. Um, I thank you for those that are able to log in and be with us virtually today. I thank you for those that are going to be out on the front lawn in advance. I'm thanking you, Lord. And I just ask that you would speak to hearts and, and encourage hearts. And uh, But most of all, Father, that you would be glorified through the preaching of your word and the response of your people to the preach word of God. Um, I pray, God, for a sense of peace. I pray for a sense of calm. I pray for a lack of distraction uh, in thought this morning. Uh, because as everyone is aware, there is a uh, very contentious election coming up in the next couple of days. And we don't know when uh, we're going to have a winner announced. So there's going to be a lot of opinions. <laughs> um, to use a not too strong of a word, that are being thrown around. And God, we pray for the people of God to be very unique in this season that we're entering and that we have been in. Would you allow your people to be unique in the sense that they are not speaking with hatred and vitriol and disgust at people who may be on the different ends of the political spectrum or the ideological uh, spectrum and would you help us to be gracious toward one another? Would you help us to love one another? God, even at the end of the day, if we consider those who are a different opinion than us our enemies, we are still called to love them. We are still called to pray for them. We are still called to serve them. God, would you let your people be marked by love and kindness and joy and grace and mercy and peace and calm uh, and not by the turmoil that the, the, the rest of the world seems to be in right now? Would you calm our hearts for these next few moments? Would you put all of those different things that we could think about and talk about out of our minds for the next few moments and allow us to just focus on the risen and ascended Jesus? We love you. We pray it in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Well, church family, we did it. We did it, okay? We made it through the Gospel of Luke. Uh, when you brought me on as your pastor over two and a half years ago, we started walking through the book of Philippians first. Uh, then we walked through the book of Jonah together. We walked through a couple of short mini-series together. But then in August 2018, we started the Gospel of Luke, which is the longest of the Gospels. And then after 72 sermons, with a few guest sermons sprinkled in with Dan and, and Jeremy and Jonathan, um, but 72 sermons that I personally have preached, we have finally come to the last passage of this incredible gospel. This gospel, it, it set out to show its readers who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Right? I mean, Luke told these stories from the perspective of eyewitnesses who were there to see it. He interviewed them. He did the painstaking research to seek out reliable sources. Luke's gospel is anything but fake news, okay? And we saw in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, sort of the summary verse of Luke's gospel, which was this, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. This account that Luke has left us with and that has stood the test of 2,000 years worth of time has been put together in such a way to make that very point very clear. Jesus loves the world. He loves the people he created. He loves them in spite of their sin. He loves them so much that he left heaven, took on humanity, and lived among us. He went through the trials and the struggles and the temptations that we go through. But he never sinned. Then in his perfect humanity, his sinless humanity, he suffered and he died for our sins. He was buried in a tomb. And then three days later, he rose from the dead. But what happens after that? That's good news, right? That's very good news. And usually when we talk about the gospel, we talk about, number one, the death, number two, the burial, number three, the resurrection. But what happens after he resurrected? And that's where we come to the last section of the gospel of Luke. So let's look at it together. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 49, and we're going to finish the gospel right here, right now. So Jesus is talking here. He says, and look, I am sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. Then he led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. After worshiping him, 
they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple praising God. Now, here's the deal. This is an important, we are biblical people, right? We are people of the book. We believe in the inerrancy of scripture, that it is true in what it teaches. It is without error. And so we believe this is true, and therefore we believe this is an important historical event, the, the ascension of Jesus. It's a wonderful truth that I've never heard a Christian say is not true, but it's also not a truth that I've really heard many Christians talk about at all. It's one of those things that I think a lot of Christians take for granted, but don't spend a lot of time really thinking about, meditating on it. Uh, but, but it's where we're at this morning. So what does it mean that Jesus ascended into heaven? Is this just something that we say? Or is it something we understand with our minds and believe in our hearts and celebrate with our praise and with our worship? Do we understand that even the joys of Easter Sunday are surpassed by the incredible truth that's in this passage? Before we get into what the ascension means, let's try to understand first what it even is, right? When Jesus was carried up into heaven, he was removed from the presence of his disciples. This was not like the other sudden disappearances that Jesus made after the resurrection, right? Remember when he showed up to the Emmaus Road disciples, he's walking with them, they don't recognize him, and they eat the meal, they realize all of a sudden who he is, and boom, he disappears, right? So we've seen some of those things in the Gospel of Luke. This is not like that. This time he didn't just vanish, he, he ascended. He actually physically rose into heaven. And the, the book of Acts that Luke also wrote. In the book of Acts, uh, he tells us rising from their sight, that, that Jesus was rising from their sight on a glorious and mysterious cloud. So this whole scene gave the ascension this idea of finality. Like this is, this is it. Leon Morris said this. He said, it's the decisive close of one chapter, but it's the beginning of another. It is the consummation or the completion of Christ's earthly work. The indication to his followers that his mission is accomplished, his work among them come to a decisive end, they can expect to see him in the old way no more. Meaning they can expect to see him in the flesh no more. So what does this mean though? What does this mean about how Jesus is present with us today? Well, we've got to understand that Jesus, from the moment he was born to the Blessed Virgin Mary, he had two natures. Okay, Jesus Christ has two, he had and he has two natures. He had a fully human nature, and at the exact same time, he had a fully divine nature. So he's 100% man, and he's 100% God at the exact same time. So he didn't, he never, Jesus never gave up his divinity. There are people that teach this. And it's, it's a heresy. It goes against what we believe as Christians. Jesus never gave up his divinity. He never stopped being equal with God the Father. That never stopped. He simply added humanity to his divinity. So the humanity was not always there. The div divine Son, though, Jesus Christ, has always eternally existed with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. But then, when he was born of the Virgin Mary, he has the humanity on top of that. All right? So he simply added humanity to his divinity, but after he did that, he never gave it up. He never gives up his humanity after he takes on humanity. For all of eternity, from that point forward, Jesus would have two natures, which means today he has two natures. So when we say that Jesus is with us even now then, or when people say things like, Jesus is within me or Jesus is in my heart, what does that mean? What does that mean? Which nature of Jesus is with us? Is his humanity with us? Like, can we see him? Can we hear him? Can we touch him? I hope the obvious answer is no, we can't do that. No, his human nature is not with us. His divine nature, though, is. The divine nature of the Son is always with us. He is equal to God the Father in that way. It is being, being able to be omnipresent. But his human nature, just like ours, because he's just as much human as you and I are. He was fully man, and you and I cannot be in two places at the exact same time. Neither can Jesus. His human nature cannot. 
It's not omnipresent. Just like you and I cannot be omnipresent, he's not omnipresent. His human nature is literally, physically, in heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father, making intercession or praying for us. Romans 8, 34 makes that clear. Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes or prays for us. So Jesus exercises the supreme authority as the God-man. He has never discarded the human nature that he took on when he was born, but has ascended into heaven in bodily form. So we have faith in the ascension of the body just as much as we have faith in the resurrection of his literal body. The same Christ who was born and suffered in the body also ascended in the body. We believe in the bodily ascension um, of the crucified, risen, and glorified Jesus. So it's, it's so important for us to understand what is happening here because it, it, it helps us understand who Jesus is. It helps us answer that question that we've been asking for the last two plus years. Who is Jesus? So now that we hopefully have a better understanding of what's happening, of, of what is happening, we can turn to why that's important. Why is the ascension practically important and how does it impact the lives of Christians? And there are four reasons that I can see here, and I think many of them are especially important in light of everything going on in our country and our world right now. So the first one is this. Here's why the ascension is important. Number one, because Jesus ascended, we get the Holy Spirit. Because he did the ascending, we now get the Holy Spirit. Every single person who is a born-again believer. Look at verse 49. And look, I am sending you what my Father promised. What does that mean? What does Jesus mean by the promise of the Father? He means the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. With this parting gift, Jesus gave his disciples the very power of God in the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the promise of God, a gift that would come only if and only when Jesus returned to the Father. Look what Jesus said in John 16 in verse 7. It is for your benefit that I go away, he said. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, though, I will send him to you. So the gift of the Spirit is absolutely essential and totally necessary for any sort of effective ministry. Uh, Jesus was sending the apostles out to be his witnesses in the world. And as they preached repentance and forgiveness through the cross and through the empty tomb, they would be utterly dependent on the work of the Holy Spirit. How could they ever fulfill their calling to reach the world for Christ in their own strength? It would have been impossible. They needed God to be with them. And the way God was with them was through the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit, not even the preaching of the gospel would have had any effect on people because faith in Jesus and repentance for sin, those are gifts that we are given by the Holy Spirit. He grants us forgiveness. He allows us to repent. He gives us the gift of being able to believe, of being able to have faith. No one ever comes to faith in Christ without the Holy Spirit doing a work in them. But praise God, Jesus has sent us the Spirit just like he promised to do. He knew that we would never make it on our own. He understood that we need the power of God for ministry and for missions and to just get through our days. So we have the power by the presence and by the work of the Holy Spirit. Here's the way 1 Thessalonians put it in chapter 1, verse number 5. Our gospel, okay, so the good news that we have, our gospel did not come to you in word only. It's not how it happened. It didn't come to you in word only. But also in power in the Holy Spirit, and with full assurance. Okay, so if we believe in the fundamental Christian doctrine of the Trinity, right? The fact that all three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if we believe that all three are one, however mysterious and difficult it might be to get our finite human brains around that, if we believe this, then that means that to receive this parting gift from Jesus is to receive the gift of God himself with us. And what greater gift could God possibly give us than the gift of himself in the person and the work of his spirit? To have the spirit is to know the truth of God's word because the spirit who inspired the word also opens our minds and hearts to understand it. 
To have the Spirit is to know forgiveness because the Spirit convicts the conscience and leads us to repent of our sin. To have the Spirit is to have eternal life because the Spirit convinces us of the truth of the gospel and enables us to believe in Jesus Christ. And then finally, to have the Spirit is to have God's comfort in every trial that we suffer. No matter how difficult, because when Jesus said that he would be with us always, he was talking about the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, who is the comforting helper of God. The first reason the ascension of Jesus is so vitally important from a practical standpoint is that because of the ascension, we get the Holy Spirit. God literally with us in all times, in all places, comforting our hearts and our minds with the finished work of Jesus. That's the first reason it's so important. Here's the second reason the ascension is so important. Because Jesus ascended, we know who the real king is. Let's think about that with everything going on right now and the season we find ourselves in. The ascension is basically the ultimate proof that Jesus was who he said he was and that he can do what he said he could do. And really, he couldn't start doing it all until he ascended. He said he was God, right? He said he was Lord. He said he was king. He said all could be saved through him. Well, his ascension, even though it's a departure from earth, is an arrival and a beginning, in another sense, of Jesus' reign as the Son of God and the King of Kings. Here's how Hebrews puts it. Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 1. It says, we have this kind of high priest, so someone in charge, who sat down, this is an important phrase here, who sat down at the right hand, hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle that was set up by the Lord and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, uh, gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it was necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Verse number four. Now, if he were on earth, so if he were still here, he would not be a priest. Since there are those offering the gifts prescribed by the law, these serve as a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. But, verse 6, but Jesus has now obtained a superior ministry. And to that degree, he is the mediator. He's the go-between between us and the Father of a better covenant. He's working this out for us, which has been established on better promises. Okay, so when Jesus ascended far above all the heavens, the Son of God returned to the place that he left behind when he became a man. He had to leave all of that up there when he came down to live among us. Now he's leaving this and he's going back up there. So he was restored then to the glories of heaven and the worship of heavenly angels. In leaving the world, he was going to the Father. And when he returned to the presence of God, he took his exalted place at the Father's right hand. And that phrase, the right hand of the throne of the majesty, that's really important. That phrase shows us Jesus' supreme authority over heaven and earth. It's not a phrase we use a whole lot, though, anymore. Today, you're you're right-handed or you're left-handed, and who cares? Maybe you're a little weirder if you're left-handed, but, you know, it's okay. We still love you. Uh, but, But in ancient times, the right hand of any ancient king was a place of exalted honor, and royal government. So for Jesus to sit down at the right hand of the Father meant that he had equal and absolute rule over the entire universe. The risen Christ is the eternal king. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22 tells us that Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. All of them are subject to him. So Jesus is king. Not just theoretically, not just someday in the future. No, no, no. Jesus is king now. He is in charge of the universe now. Angels and authorities and powers are subject to him right now. Now maybe you see where I'm going with this, but but before we get there, what should the fact that the ascended Jesus is king teach us? What should it teach us? It should teach us the third reason that the ascension is so important, and that's that because Jesus ascended, we can have joy. Like true, pure joy. 
I want you to look at verse 51 again. And while he, Jesus, was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. After worshiping him, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Before we get into the joy part, I just want you to I just want to point out an interesting fact about that verse. That's actually the only time, the first and only time in the Gospel of Luke where anyone ever worships Jesus. Um, it was like all of the disciples were finally realizing the answer to the question that we've been asking since we started this sermon series back in August of 2018. Who is Jesus? Who is he? And the answers they were getting to that question were the same answers that we've been walking through for two plus years. And you know what it caused them to do? Worship him. And then you know what the worship of Jesus led to? Joy. Joy. And this has really been a defining aspect of Jesus' life and ministry since the beginning. Because remember back at the beginning in Luke chapter 2, right? Luke chapter 2, verse number 10, Jesus is uh, just being born. The angels appear to the shepherds. And in Luke chapter 2, in verse number 10, the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. The earthly life and ministry of Jesus begins with joy, and now as we see, it ends with joy. And it's kind of interesting when you think about it, isn't it? I mean, when Jesus first died, the disciples were totally distraught, remember? They were all tore up about that. Most of them deserted him because they thought it was over. They thought it was game over. When he came to see them after his resurrection, they were, they were still confused and they were in disbelief. But finally, now, as he's telling them that he's leaving, now they're not falling into despair. Now they're doing what they should have been doing the whole time. They're rejoicing. They finally get it. They're finally realizing who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. They're finally realizing that he's Lord and that he's king and that in order to take his rightful place in that role, he's going to have to leave them. And what does that leave them with? Joy. They went back with great joy, so much joy that they were continually in the temple. They're continually praising God. They can't help it. They have so much joy. And here's where I, where I want to bring this real close to home for a minute, okay? In light of all that we're facing as a country right now, especially in light of the election that's going to take place in less than 48 hours, we, just like the disciples, can have joy in spite of chaos. It was chaotic for them. Religious leaders were against them. The government was against them. Nobody liked what these people were about to start doing. And yet in spite of it all, there was joy. Joy in spite of the chaos. Joy in spite of whoever the president may have been, whoever the governor was at that time, which means we can have joy then in spite of the chaos. We can have joy in spite of whoever the president may be, or in spite of whoever controls the Senate. We can have joy in spite of how many Supreme Court justices we have on the court or don't have on the court. That's not to say not to vote on those things or have an opinion on those things or to pray about those things or even at times to be involved in those things. Do all of that. That's fine. Have an opinion, be involved, have conversations with people, fine. But do not let any of it be ultimate. And do not let any of it affect your joy. Our joy should be found in the risen and ascended Jesus. Our joy should not be found in a political candidate or a political party. And whether or not they win an election. If our joy is found in a political candidate rather than the risen and ascended Jesus, then you know what we're guilty of? Idolatry. Idolatry. If you find more joy in your guy winning this coming Tuesday than you have in the risen and ascended Jesus, you are guilty of idolatry. And I know that many of you would say amen to this, right? I guarantee you when I, when, I, when I preach this in person outside on the front lawn, I'm going to hear people going, amen, amen, that's good. The thing is, though, I think people that are saying amen, whether or not that's you on the other side of the screen right now, you might want to communicate that amen to your social media accounts. Because you cannot say amen to what I just said on the one hand, 
and then put posts up about how horrible everything will be if the guy you don't want to, you, you don't want to end up winning, ends up winning. And you know how you and me and everyone else in your life is going to know where you find your joy? They're going to know in the next seven days, whenever they're finally able to declare a winner in this presidential election. I'm praying that it will be within the next seven days. And if you're a sore winner, if your guy wins or make it sound like the sky is falling, if your guy loses, you're just going to prove to the world that your Christianity is nothing more than a social club to make you feel better about yourself. If your faith and your joy can be that shaken because of an election for a country that's never mentioned in the Bible, that will someday pass away like every other nation has in the past, if that's what affects your joy, we are showing the world how little Christianity really matters and how little it really makes a difference compared to every other worldview out there. Because the gospel that saved me and the gospel that we preach here at Temple Baptist Church, man, it is far bigger than any result of any election at any time, anywhere. The gospel can produce the greatest joy in the darkest of times. So don't sit here holding your Bible and singing along to the words we sang a moment ago in, in the song, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Really? Then through every other action in your life, you better prove it. Otherwise, you're proving that when you do that, hold your Bible, sing that song, you're proving that it's just a show. Do you really wholly trust in Jesus' name? I mean, or, or do you dare to trust the sweetest frames of political power and Senate seats and political policy decisions and legislation? See, we can learn a lot in this regard from our African-American brothers and sisters in the past who endured the, the, the senseless, dehumanizing reality of chattel slavery in the United States. I mean, faced with generations, centuries of having their humanity stripped from them, faced with that, one of the most lively, energized, joy-filled traditions in the Christian church was born. Some of the most wonderful songs like Down by the Riverside and Swing Low, Sweet Chariot that the church of God is still seeing today. They're written when this dark cloud and egregious stain on our national conscience was going on. These brothers and sisters taught us and continue over a century and a half later, they continue teaching us how in spite of the darkest, hardest, most ruthless moments, it is possible to still have joy. It is possible to continue to lift up our voices and sing to God and trust him and trust that one day he will bring justice and one day everything will be made right they show us what it's like to have joy in spite of corrupt evil leaders who denied their basic human rights and refused to stand up to the institution of slavery when they had every opportunity to do so and if those saints of god can come through that not demoralized not with their faith destroyed or compromised, but stronger than ever and empowered to continue the cause of Christ with great joy, then we certainly can too. We certainly can too. Church family, don't, don't prove to the world this week how shallow they already think Christianity is. Show them the depth of our faith. Show them that our joy in that faith is not dependent in, in, in who sits in some egg-shaped office in a big white house or how many justices sit on that Supreme Court. Show them how the joy of saints for the last 2,000 years has endured tremendous persecution. How it's endured the rise and fall of empires and world superpowers and good presidents and monarchs along with evil corrupt ones. Show them that our joy in the faith is based not on powers and principalities of this world, but on the incarnate, suffering, crucified, buried, risen, and ascended Lord Jesus Christ, who lives evermore to make intercession for us. Show them that, yes, you love your country, but that it's got nothing on the kingdom that you're truly a citizen of. And there's coming a day when all those in Christ will be delivered from the partisan politics that plague our country right now. Because Jesus is ascended. Because Jesus is ascended, 
Jesus sits on his throne now as Lord and King. Because of that, we have the Holy Spirit working in and through us. And because of that, we can have joy. And there's one final fourth important reason that the ascension is so important. Not only does Jesus' ascension bring us the Holy Spirit, but it also guarantees, and, and joy, and, and, and we know who the king is, but it also guarantees that one day our bodies will also be resurrected and ascended with him in the same way. Because Jesus ascended, we will ascend. The Bible tells us this first Thessalonians. See, the Bible talks a lot about the ascension. It's kind of amazing that Christians don't. Uh, but here's what 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 says. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Church family, we have a wonderful Savior. And for all those that repent and believe on Him, they'll have eternal life and experience that ascension. This should also be one of the big reasons that people who are not yet Christians should consider this. Because all those who don't know Christ all those who do not turn from their sin in repentance and believe in Jesus and what he's done for them, they'll have nothing to look forward to other than separation from all of these glories for all of eternity. There's a real heaven to be gained to spend eternity with, with Christ in and with. But there's also a hell that is just as real for those that choose not to accept him. And so my challenge to anyone who may not be a Christian here is that as you hear this message of Jesus, believe on him. Turn from your sins. Believe on Jesus and join him and us one day in eternal ascended joy of being with God. And be baptized. And then together, as Philip Reichen said, we can worship Jesus for his saving work, his courageous sufferings, his atoning death, his triumphant resurrection, and last of all, his glorious ascension. And after we have seen Jesus rising to heaven and returning to the Father, there is nothing more for us to say except glory to God in the highest and praise to Jesus, the exalted Son. Church family, just keep your eyes on him and we will experience all of it. The rest of our church family is going to, uh, that, that's here in person, is going to partake of the Lord's Supper now. Because I think there's no better way for us to keep our eyes on Jesus than to actually feast upon the broken body of Christ. Um, that, was, that was broken and blood was shed on our behalf. But for those of you that are watching on the screen now, let's just have a word of prayer before we're dismissed for the afternoon. Father in heaven, again, we want to say thank you. We want to thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your love, your kindness, your sacrifice, your holiness. Father, you're so good to us, and we thank you that you were willing to send your son to die for us, that you accepted his sacrifice and rose him from the grave, that he, is, he now sits at the right hand making intercession for us. We're grateful that you allow us to have the Holy Spirit in us and with us and working through us. And we pray that as your people, that we would be sensitive to the working of the Holy Spirit, that we would also be deeply ingrained in the Word of God, so the Holy, because we know that's one of the primary ways the Holy Spirit works, is by illuminating to us and showing us your Word and your truth and your will from the very words of Scripture. And we pray that we'd be sensitive to that. And I pray for every person that does not yet know Christ that today may be the day they realize their sin, they turn from it, and they turn to the Lord Jesus, and that soon they would make the decision to be baptized. And God, we love you. Bless us now as we go. Again, help us to remember these truths, to keep our eyes fixed upon the risen and ascended Jesus this week. And we pray it in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Well, I love you, church. Thanks so much for joining us today. And I hope I can see you next week. Take care. 
everyone. It's Pastor Jonathan. I can't believe we are here. We finally closed out the Gospel of Luke together. And it took us almost two years. And within those two years, we examined together who is Jesus. You know, with everything that is going on at the moment with this health crisis and and the politics around us, the many divisions and divides, it's so easy. It's so easy for us to forget and lose sight of who Jesus is. And my prayer for us, my prayer for you who are watching this uh, this morning is that we would turn our eyes to Jesus. Then and only then will the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. Amen. Hey, really quickly, if you would like to know more what it means to be a true follower of Jesus, email us. You can email, email us by going to info at paris.church and we will get in touch with you. Now here at TBC, it's our desire for people to turn to Jesus. And we are called to make uh, disciples and we want to make disciples rooted and centered on the gospel. And if you'd like to partner with us, please consider giving today. We have several ways that you can give, whether it's online or through a mobile device. Uh, We just truly appreciate your generosity. Um, We will have all that following information there down below for you. But we hope to see you online next week at 10 o'clock a.m. Or feel free to join us outdoors on Sunday mornings, out in person, out on the front lawn at 10 a.m. as well. But until then, I hope you guys have a blessed rest of the afternoon. We hope to see you again soon. Take care. Bye.